Y'all, today we have on the Tempo. Who is Tempo? He is an AI engineer, co-founder of Deadheads NFT, and he's going to explain to us not only about the power of storytelling, connecting your community with your media brand, but also why he is not doxxed. <laughs> Oh man, welcome back. This is NFTs for newbies. Whether you're watching or listening, we got another special guest, the other co-founder of Deadheads. And this person, you cannot see him. And that is by choice. That is by design. And we actually don't know if it's Jeremy himself as well, according to Heather's conspiracy theory over here. But we got Tempo in the building and we are really excited. We talked to Jeremy already and we talked about some of the higher level things with Deadheads, but we kind of want to know a little bit, and Heather especially wants to know a little bit more tactical things. And we have some questions from our audience that we're going to ask as well but dude thank you for taking the time to join us and you know do this podcast thank you so much for taking the time and having me i love what you guys are doing with the space and educating everybody new coming in since it is such like a difficult to understand space so congratulations on all your guys success appreciate thank it so much thank you so much okay correct me if i'm wrong uh deadheads is i want to say even less than a year yeah. old and it's absolutely insane what you guys have created and i want to dig into the doc situation here in just a second so people who watch on youtube it's like why well, can't we see this what What's going on with my camera? Like this is by design. But prior to to this world, this NFT world, uh, tell us a little bit about what you were up to and uh, just give us a little bit of context before we dive into Deadheads. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's wild. I mean, Board of Yacht Club isn't even one year old yet. I believe they were sometime in April. So it's crazy. It's the space nice. is moving so wildly quickly. But yeah, we launched Deadheads back at the end of June last year. And the whole concept behind Deadheads, is, as I'm sure your viewers know if they've already listened to Jeremy, but the key concept behind it is is essentially taking content and taking this ongoing narrative that content brings you, in our specific case, it's an animated series, and using that ongoing narrative to drive consistent value to the characters within the series, which are owned as NFTs. The whole concept explores the fields of animation, entertainment, and ownership, especially. Yes. And generally, when we talk about our project, we don't necessarily say that we're an NFT project. We say that we're an NFT brand, which is mm -hmm. using NFTs as just a tool to allow fans to own characters within the series itself. So back in June, NFTs were practically a very unexplored novel concept, but this specifically like had never been done before. And so we're very much building the ship as we fly it here. And we're learning a ton along the way and, and we're building and we're innovating and we're meeting so many cool people along this journey. And I couldn't be more thankful for like not only the position that, that we're in from a project standpoint, but also the people in the community that we've built along the way. It's something really special. I got to follow up on that. Um, you know, when you say you were the first to do it like the space is so early guys we kind of talked about and but one thing I always remember coming up when I paid attention was you know first mover advantage right like so you guys are kind of first to market with the animated series and then you got guys who own some of your deadheads like Gary V who's always like don't be the first be later and see what you can improve upon are you guys starting to see other people adopt and I mean I know there's been a couple other projects but have you seen other people you know kind of take your philosophy and start to, I don't want to say infringe on it, but try and make something substantially similar or better. Yeah. I mean, in any sort of startup situation, you always have the first movers who innovate, make mistakes. Everybody else who comes in after them learns from that and builds upon that and iterates off of that. And so everybody in the end, sort of web three entertainment space, we're all constantly learning from each other. There's a lot of the things that we've done that other projects have employed as well. We're good friends with the guys over at uh, Stoner Cats, Mila Kunis, um, yeah. Ash and Butcher, that, that group. And they're also doing some incredible stuff in this space. Yeah. So I don't necessarily look at it as an advantage to be the first mover. I see it as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. But really, at the end of the day, project or the entertainment brand that's going to win in this Web3 space is going to be the one that does it best and the one that mm -hmm. produces the highest quality of content. Because at the end of the day, like if you don't have fans who want to watch the content that you're producing, you don't really have much of a project at all. So that's why like our primary focus is always on producing the highest quality content and garnering fans that want to watch not because they own an NFT and are monetarily incentivized, but to mm -hmm. watch because it's just a good fucking show. Yeah. yeah. So that's like our main ethos in this entire thing is just making sure we're always producing the best possible content and always improving on that. What, what have you learned about making that kind of content? I believe your background is in the tech space. So correct me if I'm wrong on that. I know that Jeremy has a little bit of background like in the film industry and so forth. But what have you guys learned over the past few months about creating really good content that you're alluding to? We have learned so much. 
<laughs> like thinking back to when we first began, we were we were incredibly green, um, especially me because I I come from an artificial intelligence developing background, mm. so I had no experience with the entertainment space at all and the IP space more broadly. Yeah. But the biggest thing that we've started to find out, and that we've essentially learned this just from talking to more traditional Web two people in the entertainment space, people like Roy Price, the founder of Marvel Studios, David Maisel, like all these really, really big Web2 names. And when they go and watch our content, they give us so much good advice on small little things like character development. Like in order for you to really care about a story, it doesn't just have to be a cool story, but you have to also care about the characters that are going through these high stakes situations. Otherwise, you're not really going to be invested in that. There's all these small little things that, that we've learned along the way. And we've obviously brought in some incredible team members to help with that. It's not going to be something that Jeremy and I can just learn on our own. So we're definitely making sure that we take advantage of the Web2 world and make sure that we're constantly improving um, on those aspects as well. Sorry, Rich, quick follow up to that. Yeah, please. So give me an example of like caring a little bit more about your character. So like, like let's use Damien as an example, like your main character, how when we're writing him in the story or so forth, show him a little bit of TLC to develop that out. Yeah. So the, the beautiful thing about the animation space is you can really take these characters and like emphasize the traits that they have both physically because they're obviously animated and also like from a story perspective, emotionally. And so what I've learned that a lot of other projects or not projects, but a lot of other series do is they take every character and they pinpoint two or three main sort of emotional aspects that these characters have for example like our character bosco bold is is, is a great example of this because bosco in like three words you can summarize bosco's character he likes to smoke weed a he's very like sassy b and he's also like very much like nonchalant about what's going on around him so and you know that obviously stems from smoking weed all the time but he's very easy to boil down to that and we haven't necessarily even given him a backstory yet, which is something that we can improve on. But with Damien, for example, Damien doesn't necessarily have these two or three things that you can boil down his character into that almost simplifies it in a way that allows the viewer to understand it in like a very quick way. And then you can build the layers underneath that of like the more complex nuances of the character and why he behaves this way and, and, and all these different things. Like he's very much just been thrusted into this situation. We don't really know much about him. And, you know, we're learning about him at the same time that it seems like he's learning about his world, which works in some respects. But if we really want to emphasize that connection that the fan will have with the characters, you need to build that out. I agree with you thinking back to it now, like I wouldn't be able to pinpoint exactly what he's about because he's just completely disoriented like what the yeah. fuck is happening right now like around every corner there's something going on or someone else he's meeting so when you and Jeremy were at GMI Studios um, and it says right here a creative technology company that innovates with web3 and nfts I love to know the moments before there was an nft brand or project right like when you had your skill set and he had his skill set what was the conversation like where you're like we need to jump on this because I have a feeling it's gonna explode so we had firsthand experience that was more of like a data-driven approach on why this on, on why we thought that the space was going to explode. This was back in January, February of 2021, where we launched our first project, AI Art House. We've always sort of had a passion for the, the crypto space, hadn't really dabbled into NFTs at all and didn't quite fully grasp the extent that it's going to revolutionize digital media and ownership. But when we first launched our project, AI Art House, which is basically artificial intelligence created artworks which we sold as NFTs. And then you also got a free redeemable with every NFT that we would ship to your house and you would get it framed and hang it on your wall. But what we started realizing through building that out is the power of community that NFTs build and the power that comes with that. Because we didn't quite understand that owning something that everybody else owns around you, it immediately garners this sense of, of community that's so powerful. And so we we didn't even like start a Discord or anything like that to, to try to garner this community. And we still just had like all of our collectors were so interested in, in AIs and NFTs that we started to understand that NFTs are more than just art. Because if you remember, I'm not sure how involved you were back in the space back in February, but the narrative around NFTs was very much around um, art specifically. So it's, you know, nifty gateway, super rare, just NFTs to be used as digital artworks and not so much talked about was what NFTs did to community and the other aspects of, of NFTs, such as digital ownership of 
goods other than art. And so when we started realizing how powerful NFTs were outside of just this art realm, that's when we really started digging in and trying to understand what is going to be the next wave of NFTs, because we knew that it wasn't just going to be art. And we knew that for a project to succeed, it needed to have an ongoing narrative the same way that NBA Top Shot has an ongoing narrative, Zed Run has an ongoing narrative with the races, something that brings your community back to your project. And for us, it was that animated series. And so I guess that's just a roundabout way of, of saying like, we kind of stumbled into it for the most part, but we started to understand by being in the Web3 space, how powerful it was in all these different areas aside from just art. Yeah. So so getting that intel in like February and then you guys are launching in the Alpha. summer. Alpha. Um, guys linked up in the show notes is the first six episodes of Deadheads. And you can see this is not like a thrown together project. This is no. a well-produced crafted, uh, real animated series that's just insane, the amount of talent that has been put into it. When you go through the credits and you see the, the talent involved in it, what was it like pulling that team together very quickly? Were you already a little bit, you know, just pulling from your own network, have connections there? Uh, can you give us a little bit of insight there? It was a mix. So pulling from our own network, of course, but we, we didn't necessarily have a massive network right when we launched. And what we realized very quickly after we launched was how talented our community was. So our Emmy Award winning producer came right out of the community. He just sent us a message, said, hey, I'm a three-time Emmy Award winning producer. I love what you guys are doing with the project. I would love to come on board. And, you know, obviously we're like, fuck yeah, we would love, we would, we'd love to have you on board. Like, absolute honor working with you. And that, that happened with like three or four other very important positions, animation director, producer, the animators we found out of our own network. We were all good on that side of things, but there are a lot of really talented animators that are starting to come out of our community. But bootstrapped from the get-go, the majority of the very important people came straight out of the community. So even like writers work were community members as well. And that's something that like, because you want to always tell the best possible story and all the people that we've met along the way, we have been able to obviously grow our network and now we're talking to a ton of really amazing people and working with some really talented producers, directors, you know, writers as well. So at the very start, though, it was very much bootstrapped straight out of the community. I think that's like a real business correlation, maybe like a small business correlation when you know people who are just really dialed in, who clearly show up every day and give a shit. Like you're not looking externally to fulfill this new position that it has to be created because you're growing. Like you already know the people who are potentially qualified to do it. It's a matter of having that conversation and seeing if they're down, which it sounds like that's exactly what happened. Yeah, I have a, this is a basic question, but this is a show for newbies and we keep getting this question and I'm on the meet the humans part of the website and I got dropacid.eth, metaverse expert, early AI adopter, and smart contract dev. The reason I wanted to ask you this sparked something was the question we get is on redeemables and we get it often like, hey, how do I do this? Like, how do I, if Rich, you know, has a dead head and he's able to mint two skull troopers or if maybe there's other incentives involved and mm -hmm. I go to sell it, which no dead head owner should sell, stake that shit. But <laughs> a Heather wants to buy, you know, like if there's other things in the future, like how does a smart contract allow that to happen? If you know how to answer that, but like that's a question we get all the time. Yeah, there's multiple ways of, of doing something like that. So, I mean, the easiest way and the way that we did it with Skull Troopers was, I mean, it's it's called a snapshot. And what a snapshot is, is essentially at a certain point in time. So say, you know, right now, 1.48 p.m., March 17th, we're taking a snapshot. And what a snapshot is, is it's a look at the blockchain and a look at every at all 10,000 deadheads. And you're recording down every single wallet address that owns those 10,000 deadheads. And that right there is the snapshot. So now we have a snapshot in time where we know every single one of the holders and how many deadheads they own. Using that info, you can just run a back end, which essentially just checks, okay, this wallet address is minting. Let me go ahead and check how many how many deadheads that they owned at the time of the snapshot. They owned two deadheads. Here's one free skull trooper for you. So that's that's I mean, at a very high level, that's the easiest way of doing it is snapshot based. There's also other ways, for example, how Board Ape Yacht Club is doing it right now with their ape token airdrop. You'll notice that it's it wasn't done on a snapshot basis. Every single token ID of every single ape and mutant ape corresponds to a given amount of ape token that can be redeemed. And once that ID has been recorded and saved in the in the smart contract as have being redeemed with the ape token that they get airdrop, then that can no longer be redeemed anymore. So there's Does the metadata change like on OpenSea if someone were to try and sell it. Like, can it? No, the, I mean, they could have done it that way. I mean, apes couldn't have because their metadata is completely frozen. Huh. But 
the way that the Board of Yacht Club and, and, you, and Yuga Labs has gotten around that fact is they have their own backend, which essentially you just put in the token ID and it tells you whether or not that ape token has been claimed. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. That, that, that helps a lot. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah. You know, we, we talk about ownership and owning characters, and that sounds cool conceptually. And we dug in a little bit high level with Jeremy, but I think, you know, we've never really had that opportunity before as consumers, as people who engage with content. And so I still like, I'm personally just still having a hard time really grasping like what is the advantage here? What does this mean? And like at the end of uh, these episodes in the credits, you can see NFT cast. Like this is episode uh, two. Zombie Damien is Deadheads number 9576. So if I have that NFT outside of like, that's badass, it's it's right here. What are you hoping that holders uh, do with that IP and are able to maybe, I, I guess, develop? Or, or is it mostly just this excitement piece because we love the story so much? The excitement piece and it as a collectible is half of the power of it. The other half comes with the fact that we grant commercial rights to all IP of the characters that you own. So say you're watching Deadheads and you own Bosco Bold, since we already brought him up as an awesome character, you actually own the commercial rights to that character itself. So if you want to go out and license that IP to a weed company who wants to run a commercial perhaps, or maybe you'd want to you know make your own merch, you can do that yourself without having to get our permission as the Deadheads brand. That and so still in that just messes me up. Like, I know you're saying that, but it still feels wrong to me because I've been conditioned that you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an incredibly novel concept, but if you extend it to the point, like say we get as, as say us as a show and, and as a series and as a brand gets as popular as like Star Wars or, you know, the Simpsons or Lord of the Rings or any of these incredibly popular shows, and you own one of these characters, say, you know, Bart Simpson or R2-D2 or, you know, any of these really well-known characters, owning that IP is incredibly valuable because you can go out and do whatever you want with it. Generative art, I, I was looking at JMI Studios again, and, you know, there's been opinions, including some of my own. I mean, I've seen people launch projects with generative art and I'm just like, dude, this took no talent. This took yeah. nothing. Like you're just, you're like, it's, it's clear to me um, what they're trying to accomplish, which is just like a good money grab and whatever. Obviously, that's not even remotely what's happening here. But why do you think generative art versus some of the more creative things that maybe traditional artists could turn into art or anything like that? Why does generative art at times get a bad rap because of how it's algorithmically driven? I think because of what you said, just because of how low effort a lot of the generative art is, especially the 2D generative art, like it really doesn't take a lot of time to throw together a few layers in Photoshop and randomly generate these. 10,000 NFTs. And so with the accessibility of that and how you don't even need an incredibly talented artist to make the type of art that most NFT projects have, like the space has gotten to a point where creators see all the money that these that these other creators are making. And so they just jump in, create, you know, a random set of 10,000 and just try to sell it immediately, even though it's incredibly low effort yep. and the project might not have any substance. But yep. I think as we move towards the future and, and we're already seeing it, for the most part, but these types of cash grabby projects are going to start to become a thing of the past. And in order for your project to actually raise a good amount of money, you're going to have to have a reputable team, a very clear roadmap, essentially things that like a normal startup business would need to own or would need to have in order for it to get investment from outside venture capitalist firms. And I think we're going to get there at some point soon. Obviously, there's still going to be the meme type projects like, you know, Kevin Punks or you name it, but that's just kind of the nature of the Web3 space in general, you know. You alluded to it earlier. You said something along the lines of, you know, you're, you're wanting to build a community who's falling in love with the story and not just viewing this as an investment. Like you want the story to win because you love the story. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was another interview that you and Jeremy did at one point, you know, you talked about how there's been like certain influencer who influencers who have got giving you guys the shout outs and you've seen like bump in sales and stuff, but a lot of those people end up either flipping or viewing it as that. And I believe you said that you guys are exploring shorts and so forth to try mm -hmm. to lead with story over NFT. Where are you guys at with the shorts right now? What platforms mm -hmm. are you looking at distributing on outside of YouTube to get people hooked into deadheads and then finding out that you're in an NFT Good project? Question. Great question. So the shorts specifically are being used to give us a more data-driven approach of building a story. And so traditionally, it's not possible in Web2 media. Generally, you know, you, you go, you write a script, you get funding for that script, you produce 
the series or you produce the movie, hopefully it does well, yada, yada. In our case, we can actually explore so many different premises utilizing these shorts and we can see what parts of these shorts that the community likes. And so we're, we're yes. able to explore things like characters, voice actors. We're able to explore animation style. We're able to explore different premises, of course. So there's all these different, very important aspects of the story that we can start to narrow in on and make sure we're not just dropping all our eggs in one single basket that may or may not succeed. Instead, we're able to ensure that the brand has longevity by building out all these different verticals and knowing that we're going to be able to narrow down which of these verticals is going to be successful in terms of the story. I think it's interesting that... I'm sorry, the, the distribution for shorts. Is there hmm. just one channel or several? Um, in terms of like... The are we talking like TikTok here? Y'all yeah, guys going to be throwing these yeah. on oh. IG Reels? Is it all YouTube or what do you think? Um, it'll be on it'll be on TikTok for sure. It'll be on YouTube, one hundred percent, and the majority of them will probably be on uh, on Instagram as well. Awesome, nice. Uh, I was gonna say it's it's really interesting that there's Web two and then Web three, and like Heather and I freely admit like we didn't know what Web three was like months ago. We're like, what are you talking about? Like, oh, this is Web three right now. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> but it's funny how you're talking about borrowing and lending from web two, you know, to get some of the data you need to influence some of the decisions that you're going to be making in web three. So like, is it not as like, see you later, that's so web two, you know, like, are, is there going to be a little bit more of that kind of collabor uh, collaborations and borrowing in the future, you think? Um, yes, to answer your question, there will there will definitely be and there already are a ton of these different collaborations between web two entertainment, Hollywood, and mm -hmm. sort of the the upcoming Web3 space. I would argue the way that we're doing it with the shorts is actually more Web3 than Web2 in a lot of ways because we're okay. utilizing our well-distributed community to, yeah. to get that data to pinpoint which of these stories is going to be most successful. But to answer your question, like, yeah, like we've, we've spoken to a ton of different Web2 media brands who are looking to come into the Web3 space and we're both borrowing from each other in, in a lot of different ways. The, the Web3 space is all about utilizing this new technology in order to build community and to add an additional dimension to your storytelling and the web two space they obviously have it absolutely dialed in but that's telling the best possible story and telling the best possible story is a prerequisite to success 100 percent one of the things admittedly that really well there's a lot of things that confuses me about web three tempo don't get me wrong okay like girls a newbie here a student but this whole like doc situation it's just completely blown my mind like we rich and i started this journey in august but we didn't know anything about this world and when people started using the term docs and we looked it up and we realized it i guess lack of better terms like there's almost like this identity that's kind of hidden like the real life identity that's hidden in this space it completely confused me and you know there's a a lot of i guess wisdom put out there of like hey teams that are fully doxed we know the people behind the brand so it's easier to trust them or look them up and see their background and so forth however i've had people argue and share a few things with me about the perks of like leaders like yourself who choose to remain, I guess, anonymous. You're not anonymous. You're using your voice and you're very active on social media, but not, you know, showing your face or giving your real name. Can you explain that to newbies? If you're building this empire and doing all these cool moves and so forth, what was your decision making process there? And how can we kind of relook at that when we're looking at web three so it doesn't seem so foreign? Yeah. So so the term is pseudo pseudo anonymous. It's essentially like having a digital identity at the forefront as opposed to your actual human identity. <laughs> so it is incredibly web three, the way that people do this. And, and that there's, you know, it's incredibly common in the space just because of how new the space is and sort of the fact that there's so much money at play. Like there are a lot of situations that have happened to people in the past where like, it's incredibly fortunate that you're not doxxed because people are losing money on your project and they're going to blame you. And, you know, they, they're incredibly angry about it. I think that's what a lot of it stems from, but it also comes with the fact that my digital identity actually has has more of a reputation in the space than my actual identity. Interesting. And that's something that seems super crazy. But the fact is tempo in the space carries a lot more weight than my actual name. No one actually knows who I am at a personal level. Whereas tempo actually has a reputation because you know, I've I've built all these things and I've I've come into the space and people know who I am and my voice and and you know they they trust they trust the decisions that I make and they know that I'm always making these decisions for the betterment of the space and for the betterment of our communities. And so it's not necessarily a necessity to have 
a doxed leader. I think in our case with Jeremy and I, it works very well having one of us as being doxed and having Jeremy being the face, especially when we're talking to different businesses, et cetera, like more B2B type, but also when we're talking to our community, just having that face that people know and trust and can get behind. And then having me, who is the pseudonymous one of the group, being sort of the more <laughs> mysterious tech AI type of role. The way that Jeremy and I have done it has, has worked out quite well for us. And I think in the future, it'll probably start to trend towards the majority of projects having doxed leaders, or at least having a doxed leader, just because of the amount of rug pulls that are happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. One quick follow up on that. Um, yeah. Just from like a identity thing. I'm super curious. I've shared many times on the show before, you know, it's hard for me sometimes separating like online time and offline time. It, do you find it like helpful to have like a separate identity where you can kind of go rest? Or is there like a conflict there where you're like, am I Tippo? Am I me? I don't know who I am. You know what I mean? Like what's the <laughs> psychological stuff there going on? That That is a hilarious question, actually. I, I haven't really thought about it too much, but on my computer, I do have two accounts. One of them's for me and one of them's for Tempo. So it's like, I do kind of digitally live these two different lives. Like I, I still have my own personal Instagram account with my own personal friends, but then I do obviously have Tempo who is, you know, more logged into Twitter all the time and on that kind of <laughs> social media. Um, yeah, I actually haven't given that much thought, but that's, that's, yeah. Yeah, I, I can imagine it. Cool. Like, you know, you're having a bad day and you're like, as as you, the regular person, you're like, man, Tempo wouldn't be a little bitch about this. Like, <laughs> like get up, like, you know, just flip it, flip into the one that you prefer. But that that is a good question. Thank you yeah. for the answer so much. And we're going to wrap up. Obviously, we can't wrap without asking now that season one is uh, just about complete. What can people expect? What are you, you know, drumming up for season two? Because we're all really excited about it. Season two is going to be whichever short we discover to be the most successful. And so at this point, we don't even know what the season two is going to be. And that's the power of using this more data-driven approach that we can go ahead and, and release all this fun content, different styles, different stories, different everything, and figure out which of these hits the hardest and then double down on those. And that's going to be season two and onwards. That's awesome. Right. Well, that's it, y'all. Make sure you check out Deadhead's animated series. Everything is linked up in the show notes. I would start personally just with the YouTube and see exactly what we're talking about. I think it's going to help conceptualize a lot of these, but also their Discord, et cetera, is in the show notes. Thank you so much, Tempo, for joining us, and we'll see you next time.